It is my great honor and privilege to welcome Mr. N.K. Singh, whom we all affectionately call N.K. Uh, in this conference, so far, we have abstained from giving full introductions of the speakers uh, and referred to their bios that have been circulated in advance. Uh, but my own recollection is that uh, uh, traditionally the IPF lecture has been a separate uh, evening event. Uh, and the chair of the session gets to give a fulsome introduction of the distinguished invited speaker. Uh, and given the illustrious career of our speaker today, uh, it will be a double folly on my part if I were to deviate from that tradition and follow what we have been doing uh, in the preceding four days. I'm sure everyone in the audience here knows something about NK, but I also suspect that almost no one knows everything that I'm about to say, uh, unless they have carefully read his wonderful recent autobiography titled Portraits of Power. So if you haven't read it, uh, I think, you know, and particularly if you want to know uh, uh, the, the history of uh, 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 post-independence India, especially starting in the 96, early 1960s, uh, from inside, uh, it uh, offers probably the best account that's uh, available. So highly recommend that and NK writes it beautifully. So NK uh, uh, is a successful bureaucrat, economist, politician, diplomat, and author. And that is not all of it. You'll see it as I come to the end. Uh, this year he completes 80 successful years of life and he shows no signs of uh, uh, either tiring or retiring. Uh, indeed, currently, very actively, he is leading India's track to dialogue with China, uh, uh, having just completed uh, uh, his uh, big uh, uh, assignment as uh, the chair of the 15th Finance Commission uh, with uh, uh, great uh, success. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, uh, commission, I should say, in view of uh, uh, COVID having hit in the midst of uh, its work, but, but uh, 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 NK very successfully steered the entire process uh, uh, to the dissatisfaction of no one. Uh, prior to that, NK chaired the FRBM review committee, uh, uh, on which I think Arvind uh, Subramanian probably served as well. Uh, and, and, and wrote a note of dissent. Uh, 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 prior to that, uh, I'm going in the reverse order here uh, of, of how the events unfolded. Uh, NK was a member of the Rajya Sabha and prior to that, he was a member of the Planning Commission. Uh, then if we go further back, we get to Prime Minister Vajpayee Yara uh, when NK was his private secretary. And of course he was, uh, he played a very pivotal role in a number of uh, economic reforms that uh, were uh, undertaken during the Vajpayee era, including the, the uh, uh, also the, the well-known road project, which uh, uh, was a complete game changer uh, uh, in the building of infrastructure uh, of India uh, uh, once the reforms had been launched. NK also, prior to being the private secretary to, uh, 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 to uh, not, but he was a secretary to the prime minister, actually, private secretary is a different position. Uh, so he was secretary to the prime minister. Uh, uh, prior to that, uh, uh, NK actually uh, had served in all the three departments of the finance ministry as the secretary. Uh, at that time, there were in fact only three departments. Now it, the departments have proliferated. So he was the, uh, uh, Secretary De Department of Economic Affairs, Secretary of Revenue and Secretary of Expenditure. Uh, and particularly as Secretary of Revenue, uh, uh, he was involved in that famous uh, uh, dream budget. Uh, and, and if you read his biography, you will find out, his autobiography, you'll find out that uh, uh, had it not been for him, uh, that dream budget would have been uh, only a pipe dream. Uh, he joined IAS uh, at uh, a young age of 23 years in 1964. Before that, he uh, uh, taught as a lecturer at St. Stephen's College. Before that, he did MA in economics in Delhi School of Economics, was taught by all the luminaries who uh, were at the Delhi School of Economics at the time, uh, including Jagdish Bhagwati and Padma Desai. And finally, uh, uh, and this is what 
I said in the beginning that uh, you know his introduction as a, a, a bureaucrat, diplomat, uh, a politician, and all was still incomplete because uh, uh, hobby-wise uh, he is also a homeopath. Uh, he uh, does uh, uh, very successfully homeopathy. So if you have any ailments, uh, you can go to him. Uh, he does photography. Uh, he uh, indulges in uh, Indian classical music. Uh, and of course, uh, the list of his friends is absolutely endless. Uh, and they are all his close friends. <laughs> so, uh, uh, NK, uh, it is a great pleasure uh, uh, that you're going to enlighten us today on the subject of federalism during the, the pandemic. It is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me begin by saying how overwhelmed I am by this long introduction um, by you, Arvind, as usual, full of endearing affection and generosity, uh, which, is, uh, which is so apparent. So thank you for your very long and very, very warm words. I'm indeed very grateful to uh, the NCAER I, I, was, I have been privileged to be associated with NCAER, just like you, uh, just like you, Arvind, with the, having worked with uh, Suman Berry and Shekhar Shah uh, very closely, having seen its evolution, and having uh, interacted with uh, Suman and with Shekhar on multiple occasions uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, indeed, I think uh, I must express my gratitude to the NCAER for the privilege they have given me to invite me to this 18th India Policy Forum lecture on federalism uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Poonam Gupta, who had interacted with me when I was chairman of the Finance Commission in her earlier capacity, in a short time after taking over this responsibility as the new Director General of the NCAER, has arranged this exceedingly cohesive event over these uh, this and uh, indeed it shows the great heights that uh, NCAER will reach under the able stewardship and guidance of the Poonam. So all my good wishes for your resounding success in this career. As I said uh, that uh, my personal friend, uh, scholar, policy shaper, Arvind Panagaria has left an indelible footprint in not only in academia in India, in but academia in the Columbia University, where he's been teaching. And of course, uh, as the inaugural vice chairman of the Niti Aayog, gave uh, purpose and content to an organization which had just emerged uh, after the abolition of the Planning Commission. And I think it was at that period that uh, Arvind had set up uh, exceedingly high standards uh, for the Niti Aayog, which is difficult for, for many of his successors to successfully emulate. Constitutions, as they say, are written with predictability and certainty. They are not designed for black swan events like the pandemic. To quote James Madison, in, and I quote, in framing a system which we wish to last for ages, we should not lose sight of the changes which ages would inevitably produce, unquote. This is equally true to rules, regulations, conventions, and laws. The term federalism, as many of us know, was introduced by the German-born American economist, Richard Musgrave, in 1959. According to Wallace Oakes, writing in 1999, much later on fiscal federalism in India, it said, and I quote, it is concerned with understanding of which functions and instruments are best centralized and which are best placed in the sphere of decentralized levels of government. The concept applies to all forms of government, unitary, federal, and confederal." Unquote. The evolution of federalism in India has a long genesis. It primarily dates back to the Government of India Act of 1919 and 1935. While the Act of 1919 provided a separation of revenue heads between the central government and central provinces, the 1935 Act allowed for the sharing of centers' revenues for the provision of grants in aid to provinces. 
the government of India act of 1935 established the basic structure of fiscal federalism in India, one that survives even today. Article one of our constitution, as we know, describes India, that is, quote, Bharat as union of states rather than federation of states, unquote. The country is described as a union, although its constitution is federal in nature. In the famous speech on the 4th of November, 1948, while moving the draft constitution in the Constituent Assembly, B.R. Ambedkar responded to a question of why India is a union and not a federation of states. And he said, and I quote, the drafting committee wanted to make it clear that although India was to be a federation, the federation was not the result of an agreement by the states to join in the federation and that the federation not being the result of an agreement, no state has a right to secede from it. The federation is a union because it is indestructible. Political scientist Alfred Stephen classified India as holding together as opposed to coming together. Unlike the federal system of government in the United States, which is described as an indestructible union composed of indestructible states, India is an indestructible union of destructible states. Broadly speaking, on the evolution of fiscal federalism, there has been marked stability in the process and procedures. The annual budgetary processes of both the center and the federal governments are independent exercises and have to go through the parliament or the state legislature. The Finance Commission, which was first constituted in 1951 under Article 280 of the Constitution, has had an unbroken legacy. It performs the functions broadly enshrined in Article 280 of the Constitution. Basically, the president is expected every five years to constitute a finance commission with the purpose of advising on the distribution of net proceeds of all taxes between the union and the states, and thereafter is distribution among the states as grants in aid. For most of post-independence era, the existence of the planning commission had injected a centralizing dependence in more ways than one. The planning commission became an extra constitutional parallel institution for the transfer of resources from the union to the states. While the focus of the finance commission was in the revenue account, the planning commission was concerned predominantly with the capital account. Successful finance commission, as we know, commented on this as being inconsistent with the spirit of the constitution in the devolution of resources. There are other developments like the 73rd and the 74th amendment of the constitution in 1992, giving status to Panchati Raj institutions and urban local bodies with specific functions assigned to them under the 11th and the 12th schedule. As a coordinating entity between the center and the states, two key institutions have remained. The National Development Council constituted in 1952 to oversee the work of the planning commission to approve the five-year plans and the midterm appraisal and the Interstate Council by a constitutional amendment in 1990 based on the recommendations of the Sarkaria Commission report. So what are the challenges of Indian federalism? Now, I divide the challenges into two parts. I divide the challenges which existed in the pre-pandemic period, namely they had only grown over a period of time. And then there are some new challenges which have emerged based on the pandemic, which would justify the theme of today's lecture. So let me deal with the pre-pandemic challenges, which in many ways are opaque and have existed for long. First, the future of the seventh schedule. I need to dwell on this a bit. The seventh schedule of the constitution broadly demarcates the functions of governance into three entities. The schedule distributes the legislative and financial powers between the union and the states, list one to the subjects of the union, list two to the subjects which belong to the states, and list three to the list of the concurrent list, which belongs to both the union and the states. And in the event of conflicting legislation, the law passed by the union shall prevail. Over a period of time, as we know, the concurrent list has sought to occupy increasing space. This is not only true by the 42nd amendment of the constitution in 1975, who shifted the subject of forest and education from the state list to the concurrent list. Further, in 1976, 
family planning was added to the concurrent list. This is the bedrock indeed of all subsequent national population policy, which anecdotally currently is being debated in multiple forms. This transfer to the concurrent list of population policy means that the principal obligation in relation to issues of family planning are in the domain of both the center and the states, except as I said earlier, any central legislation would clearly override any laws made by the state. While these were formal acts entirely, which I mentioned, there were other changes to constitutional amendments in ways which have whittled down the original intent of the sense schedule. Take for instance, the issues of entitlement driven legislations. Some time ago, we entered an era of entitlement driven standalone legislations the classic examples being the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme of 2005, the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act in 2009, the National Food Security Act in 2013. How do these standalone entitlement legislations mesh with the seventh schedule of the Constitution? How do they transgress the earmarked borders? And how is it that none of the states at any stage oppose the transgression of these limits. This was the area where hope where we felt that the fiscal romantics should have really intervened as employment, education, and food were entirely intended to be in the domain of the states. The issues of the autonomy of the state, I scarcely remember ever came up for serious analytical critique. Political expediency pervaded the constitutional misgivings. Second, the issue of the incongruence of Article 282 of the Constitution with the letter and spirit of the seventh schedule. The Article 282 of the Constitution, which says, quote, the union or a state may make grants for any public purpose, notwithstanding the purpose is not one with respect to which parliament or the legislature of the state, as the case may be, may make laws. Originally in the constitution, it was not expected to be an overarching provision, but an extraordinary one to be used very sparingly. And if I quote K. Santanam, the chairman of the second, seventh, uh, second Finance Commission on Article 282, he said, and I quote, this was not intended to be one of the major provisions for making readjustments between the union and the states. And if that was to the idea, then there was no purpose in evolving such a complicated set of relationship of shares and assignments and grants. There is no purpose in having two articles enabling the center to assist the states, one through the Finance Commission and the other through more executive discretion. In the latter case, even parliamentary legislation is not needed. Of course, it will have to be included in the budget, but beyond being an item in the budget, no further sanction needs to be taken. Therefore, in my view, this article was a residuary article a reserve article to enable the union to deal with unforeseen contingencies. That was how this article was used both by the British government and after the transfer of power before the first five year plan under this article, only some things like the grow more food grants and some rehabilitation were given. Similarly, Nani Pal Kivala, the constitutional expert in the opinion which he gave to the ninth finance commission on article 282 said, quote, Article 282 is not intended to enable the union to make such grants as fall properly under Article 275. Article 282 embodies merely a residuary power which enables the union or a state to make any grant for any purpose irrespective of the question whether the grant is one on which the grantor has legislative power, unquote. So this is another second issue. I will comment on this a little later. Third. In view of this, and along with changes in the part 12 of the constitution, which resulted in the adoption of the GST designed to make India into one common market and entity. The GST council, which is also a constitutional body, undertakes decisions through its fitment committee on rates of GST, GST taxes, both parliament and state legislatures have assigned their financial powers to this empowered committee. In the states, which the Finance Commission visited and being part of the Finance Commission, the states invariably complained 
that their fiscal autonomy has been greatly circumscribed by the GST and the room for maneuver on revenues has now been greatly circumscribed. It is no doubt a case of pooled sovereignty for the betterment of common good. Nonetheless, the GST Council is still in its nascent phase and needs to revisit its design and decision-making process in a more fundamental way. The entire area of GST reforms is an ongoing dynamic. In the report of the 15th Finance Commission, which was recently submitted, these reforms have been extensively analyzed and also the necessary and the necessary changes to fulfill its original purpose. Having dealt with these classic challenges which are pre-pandemic, I now make some comments on the new challenges which the pandemic has brought before us. These new challenges, it is inevitable that a global pandemic was emerged for the first time after independence, the constitution and the constitutional division of powers is an uncharted territory. The most fundamental lesson of India's experience with the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is that managing a grave national crisis requires federalism by way of fiscal fraternity of center and the states. The federal government must inevitably take the anchor's play. In the constitutional play of events, from a federal perspective, the seventh schedule of the constitution, which distributes the power between different constituents, units, union and the states, gives states the precedence over the center on the health. Entry 81 of the union list grants a legislative power for interstate migration, interstate quarantine to the center. Meanwhile, entries one, two, and six of the state list give the legislative field of public order, police, and importantly, public health and sanitation, hospitals and dispensaries to the states. But entry 23 and 29 of the concurrent list allocate the areas of social security, social insurance, employment, unemployment, and prevention of the extension from one state to another of infectious diseases or contiguous diseases or pests affecting men, animal, and plants to both the center and the states. There is therefore, as you can see, significant overlap and opacity in the demarcation of roles, functions, and responsibilities. The constitution further states under article 73 and 162 that the executive power of the union and the states is coextensive with the legislative power. Thus, from a constitutional scheme of things, the state governments are expected to play the primary role in the management of healthcare, as well as law order, while the center is expected to provide the overarching national leadership, facilitate coordination among key federating units, monitor the overall pandemic situation, provide financial and other critical assistance to the states. As the crisis loomed large in India in early March 2020, the center and the states invoked two available legal instruments to deal with the crisis. The center declared the pandemic as a notified disaster and cited the Disaster Management Act of 2005 in particular to impose the national lockdown on 24th March 2020. As the word disaster was not present in the seventh schedule, the center used its residuary powers to invoke the law and to issue various directions to the states as the pandemic situation aggravated. The states for their part turned to the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897, which empowers the states to deal with an epidemic-like situation. Many state governments use this law to issue state epidemic diseases, COVID-19, 2020 regulations for their jurisdiction, including restrictions on movement, closure of commercial establishment, offices, and other public places. Various sections of the Indian Penal Code 1860 were used by the states as a guide for laying down punishments of violators much before the center started to issue their own guidelines. So as a federal response, the pandemic has evolved in multiple ways. The following comments would summarize the key responses and the dynamics they involve. The first wave, as I see, is a play between central unilateralism and state autonomy. The constitution provisions and the existing legislations 
confer the primary responsibility to handling a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic to state governments. Nonetheless, the center assumed, rightly so, the role of an anchor led from the front in managing the pandemic, particularly during the period involving the national lockdown from 24th March to 31st May 2020. As the pandemic threatened human life and livelihoods, demanding swift action on a national scale, the center took over many important responsibilities, which otherwise may have been in the domain of the states. The center took the series of decisions to upscale vaccine, procurement, knowledge production, setting standards, laying guidelines for state and local governments, and mitigation of interstate and enhancing of interstate externalities. Therefore, the pandemic invoked the wider powers of the center in, in its fullest form, especially in the earlier phases. It was the center that imposed the lockdown. It was also the center that monitored the state responses, including physical distancing, including norms for regulation of economic activities, and importantly, the provision of financial package. Now, after the first wave of the pandemic, which was more about the unitary manner, understandably a centralized process by the union. The opposite has been the case during the second phase. Louis Tillen, a well-known scholar on federalism, captures this trend succinctly when she says, and I quote from her, India has moved from unilateral centralized decision-making in the first wave to something that approximates unilateral decentralized decision-making in the second wave, unquote. For the center in the first wave acted swiftly and decisively as it must have to well deal with this national emergency. The decentralization logic became more visible in the case of the vaccination policy. As a country faced acute vaccine shortage, many state governments called for autonomy to procure vaccines from international markets. The center exceeded as analysts found it practical given the demand supply mismatches and the competition for vaccines. Several states which went ahead with tenders for procuring vaccines found no prospective bidders. This along with the issue of differential pricing of vaccines created an untenable situation. It soon became a contentious aspect of India's federal architecture as the center and the states sought to, to really buy in, and to, in order to end this asymmetry. It even required the intervention of the Supreme Court to end sometimes this deadlock. There was also the issues, apart from the center state coordination, various state governments ran into conflicts with other state governments on the availability of oxygen, essential medicines, and seeking to garner access and supply chains. The intervention of the Supreme Court in seeking to resolve this deadlock between the states and among the states was really an important issue. In the end, order prevailed. The issue of vaccine procurement and supplies at the most optimum price is in the domain of the central government as it should be. Equally, the interplay between international diplomacy, foreign policy, encouraging new vaccine supplies in an orderly way with this new approach, which is now being adopted to deal with the ongoing pandemic. This would be equally applicable in case the pandemic lingers on or there's an emergency or another variant, which is loosely being called the third wave emerges. Launching the nationwide federal response, the prime minister speaking to the nation on the 20th of April, appealed for COVID appropriate behaviors, seeking all authorities to ramp up responses quickly. So as I look way forward, looking at the ongoing changes which were needed, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, what are the key issues relating to the entire issues of federation, which we need to look at. First, the substantive point is to look at the seventh schedule in a contemporary context. Unless we redraw the contours of the schedule, some of the incongruities between the contour of the seventh schedule and Article 282 of the Constitution and the standalone legislations of Parliament will remain cluttered and opaque. Both in theory and in practice, Many beliefs and principles which prompted our forefathers to give the constitution its present shape need some basic reconsideration. Long before I say so, in a report submitted as early, much before the pandemic, 
1971 by a committee called the Raja Mannar Committee, also known as, as the Committee on Center State Relations Inquiry Committee, he, it, he had said, and I quote, that it is desirable to constitute a high-powered commission consisting of eminent lawyers, jurists, elderly statesmen to examine the entries of list one and three and the entries in the concurrent list or the seventh schedule of the constitution to effect a redistribution suited to the challenges of contemporary times." Unquote. Second, the asymmetry in the working of the GST Council and the Finance Commission deserves serious consideration. The Finance Commission recommends distribution of resources and revenues between the Union and the states and thereafter among the states and further to the third tier. They look at projections of expenditure and revenue, but the issue of GST rates, exemptions, changes, and implementation of indirect taxes are entirely in the domain of the GST Council. This leads to unsettled questions on the ways to monitor, scrutinize, and optimize revenue outcomes, since both the Finance Commission and the GST Council are constitutional bodies the coordination mechanism between the two is now an inescapable necessity. For the first five years of the GST, a 14% guaranteed compensation by the Goods and Services Tax Compensation States Act of 2017 was provided to the states. The fact that the GST Council is a permanent body, while the Finance Commission is not, and makes its awards for every five to six years, span further complicates the dynamics, the commonalities of the issues, and the absence of any recourse mechanism to, for a course correction is an aspect that many states have highlighted to us. Third, with the abolition of the Planning Commission, many economists and policy makers have argued about an institutional vacuum. While the NDC is performing an important function, the states have pleaded for a credible institution acting as a link for a policy dialogue with the center. Many countries in the world, like Australia, states came up in 2005 to set up a council for the Australian Federation to jointly represent their interests in Canberra. We have an institutional mechanism, but how to rejuvenate and rekindle, let us say this interstate council, deserves serious consideration. In this institutional vacuum, there also needs to be serious consideration on building entities by way of permanent consultation and consultative mechanisms. Fourthly, the reforms in public financial management systems is a continuing process. Previous finance commissions have recommended and commented on various aspects of the PFM systems of both the union and the states with focus on budgetary accounting processes and financial accounting. Now, in the post pandemic period, we need some of these things. One, in the light of the pandemic, the endemic neglect of the health infrastructure and the health sector needs a thorough redress. This must be a high priority because having become painfully aware, given the multiplicity of factors, this may not be the last pandemic. At the national level, the strengthening of the healthcare infrastructure based on the recommendations of the National Health Mission of 2005, the National Health Mission of 2017, public outlay needs to be substantially augmented. We cannot get away from centering district hospitals and the multiplicity of cares and the multi-speciality cares at the district level, along with avail increased availability of manpower, even in the course to deal with our normal health programs. Apart from this, strengthening district hospitals and primary health centers at the block level is a matter of important priority. Many of these regulatory and other changes have been outlined in the report of the Finance 15 Finance Commission, which has specially devoted a chapter on health. Among other things, they include the need for a permanent national health service based on the best international practice and other innovative changes like DND course or training of paramedics, which can have immediate multiplier effect. The National Rural Health Missions recommendations and some notable examples of well functioning decentralized health systems would be worthy of replication. In this regard, a sum of rupees 70,000 plus crores has been assigned by the Finance Commission for primary health centers, district hospitals, and to strengthen 
the diagnostic capability at the grassroots level in order to enhance our capability. These have been fully implemented by government and their recommendations have commenced. Sixth, the need for a comprehensive national legislation. In many ways, the pandemic has exposed the inadequacies of the existing constitutional and legal provisions in dealing with a pandemic or a health emergency with a pan-India dimension. There are concerns about the vagueness of both the National Disaster Management Act 2005 and the Epidemic Act of 1897 in the context of a pandemic. While both these laws do not have provisions relating to health emergencies, both the states and the center resorted to either an expansive, resorted to an expansive interpretation or ad hoc measures, such as issuing ordinances to protect the frontline workers or ensure implementation of social distancing norms. This makes it imperative for the federal government to initiate the drafting of a comprehensive national legislation that can effectively deal with pandemics like COVID-19 and other national emergencies that India could face in, in future. Seventh, a more de democratic decentralization with the third tier. These are, there are extraordinary stories of success by many states in strengthening the role of the third tier during the pandemic. Illustratively, the Odisha government in delegating powers to the Sarpanj, the protocols followed by the Mumbai Municipal Corporation in coordination with the Mumbai police, or in the role of local bodies in Kerala or in other states as well, which I've listed in, in my speech, which will be circulated subsequently with the permission of NCAER. The next big issue is the issue of aligning the fiscal and debt path of both the center and the states. This is an arduous, but an inescapable task. A differentiated debt path of states, which recognize the present constraints and the issue of legacy debt must be handled with sagacity and sensitivity. This issue has been greatly aggra aggravated during the pandemic. Many countries have am amended their fiscal rules to provide for additional public spending to revive their economies that have been adversely affected. Fiscal rules provide a credible commitment to fiscal prudence. They set a limit on fiscal aggregates, such as the level of fiscal deficit, public debt, the growth of public expenditure. The key feature of such fiscal legislations is invariably the escape clause. Such a clause allows for temporary deviation from fiscal targets in the event of unforeseen circumstances. This is equally true of the fiscal policy framework, which we have currently in vogue. Many Asian countries, uh, middle-income countries emerging have in fact altered their fiscal framework dramatically to deal with the issues of the pandemic. In 2018, India also adopted a comprehensive set of amendments to the FRBM Act of 2013. These are all in public domain. This also has a, st a statutory escape clause in accordance with the recommendations, which permits the central government to resort to invoking the escape clause, but the limits are small, 0.5% of GDP, the conditions under which the escape clause has to be invoked have been rather tightly driven to deal with acts of national security, acts of war, natural calamity, collapse of agriculture, or affecting farm incomes, uh, far-reaching structural reforms in the economy with unintended fiscal consequences. The deviations which have been permitted are rather small. The escape clause also mandates the reason for the deviation and articulation of a return path after the, the urgency is over. So even before the pandemic, the escape clause had been invoked informally to deviate from the fiscal deficit targets. While presenting the budget of 2021, the finance minister used the escape clause to deviate from the fiscal deficit of 3.3% for 2019-20. The escape clause was also used to deviate from the target for the next financial year, 2021. Using the escape clause enabled them to relax the fiscal deficit target by only 0.5% of GDP. The finance minister, while presenting the budget speech, mentioned on the need to redraw 
and to have a new, fresh fiscal roadmap. This has now become an inescapable necessity. Indeed, the Finance Commission has made a pointed suggestion for the constitution of an intergovernmental group, intergovernmental because it must have the center and the states to evolve a more realistic fiscal roadmap given the ongoing pandemic and the uncertainty it entails. In the long run, of course, no doubt, fiscal institutions like the Fiscal Council would add great value. So if I really look back in the first wave of the pandemic it was about unilateralism and overtly centralized response by the center. The opposite has been the case during the second case, which has been more known as one closer to a confederation. A confederation, which is also known as a con confederacy or the league is a union of sovereign groups united for a purpose and a common action. Likewise, the relationship within the member states and the general government and the distribution of powers and functions varies greatly. In the past few months, the country has witnessed an interesting but remarkably coordinated effort by the center and the states in addressing a collective challenge. The exigency and the responses has helped us greatly in enriching and improving the mechanisms for federal governments. The experience, however, offers an opportunity to revisit the recent debate around federal organizations of power under the Constitution 7th schedule. It has also been argued that such organizations of power not cast in stone and the arrangement requires a review. Such an exercise is needed but what would be its broad contours? The review shall allow and must allow for carving out a, a clearer role of the center and the states to address the hitherto disregarded and the emerging concerns and, and the issue of the viral and climate change, for instance, would compound some of the challenges which it has. In conclusion, I would say, even prior to the pandemic, federalism in India had multiple challenges. Its fragility has been greatly compounded by the underfunded and neglected health system and the weak state capacity. In the spirit of cooperative federalism, in a broader sense of the term, has been an abiding theme of our federal policy. The most important lesson is one of flexibility. Flexibility between unitary, federal, and confederate. The evolving role of the central government as a principal anchor in extraordinary times like these is an inescapable national priority. The engagement of the state governments, not only in implementation, but in amelioration, containment, rollout, and engagement of all stakeholders is a synergy without which our responses would not be optimal. Further, going beyond centralization or decentralization, the engagement of the third tier of government with the initiatives of both the center and the states would enhance our reach, coverage, awareness, and would prove to be an important bulwark in times like these. It has been said that unity is a vision. It must have been part of the process and the pace of learning. Indeed, Ravindranath Tagore had said that the significance which is in unity is an eternal wonder. As we look to this complex issue and the dynamics of evolving fiscal federalism, federalism in the broader context, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, it is the unity of purpose, which may remain an eternal wonder, but we must really clasp the opportunities which the current crisis has given us. Thank you very much, Arvind, for this opportunity. And forgive me for having somewhat stepped the time. I am indeed grateful for your generosity. Not at all, NK. Thank you very much for that extremely wide ranging uh, uh, lecture on the subject. Uh, I, uh, I think I'm very pleased that your lecture is written, uh, if I gather that from uh, yes. uh, uh, you having read from the notes. Uh, so, you know, conventionally, uh, IPF lecture has not been published, but this is uh, partly because <laughs> these lectures are given without being written. Uh, um, but uh, I would urge uh, 
Poonam, Barry, and, and Karthik uh, to, to kind of, you know, at least circulate it, even if it's only a, as a freestanding lecture, because uh, it, it really has enormous amount of meat and, and uh, both looking back as well as uh, uh, forward looking uh, in terms of what went wrong and, and, and uh, uh, what we ought to do uh, going forward. Uh, so I hope uh, uh, this can be uh, this can be circulated quite widely. Uh, I, I would certainly uh, uh, hope to be able to use in some of the courses on the Indian economy uh, here that I do. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, before I open the floor, uh, uh, if NK, I can ask you a couple of questions. I think Poonam has been generous to give us some time. Uh, and uh, uh, Poonam, how much time do we have? Uh, um, you have a good uh, 30 minutes, actually, to the panelists. Perfect, perfect. So, uh, and a couple of questions I want to ask uh, first. Um, uh, you know, one of the problems here, uh, historically, has been that things that really ought to fall in the area of states, you know, uh, uh, and which were originally assigned to the states, uh, often it happens that the reforms don't proceed. And, and this is because I think locally, the vested interests are extremely powerful. And that automatically leads to demands on the center to take action, even though center really doesn't actually have, doesn't and shouldn't have the jurisdiction. Give you a couple of examples. Land reforms. Now, you know, Generally, as a part of the independence movement, there was general agreement for the abolition of the uh, zamindari, meaning you know the landlord system and all. Uh, that got done uh, uh, fairly quickly soon after independence. But the other part of the land reform, which was to redistribute land, did not actually happen because in the background, these landlords were extremely politically powerful. They were in the members of the legislative assemblies and so forth. So, so very little redistribution, except in a couple of states, you know, maybe Gujarat, Andhra, or uh, 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 like that happened. Uh, so land reform in, in India, in, in, in terms of land distribution to the tiller was particularly unsuccessful. And then that of course led to all sorts of uh, 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 strange kind of tenancy uh, laws, which, which till today uh, which have not turned quite counterproductive, you know, uh, 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 in effect, you know. Uh, another example is the farm laws. Uh, you know, you know uh, 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 Prime Minister Vajpayee kind of tried to initiate these uh, uh, reforms, uh, and, and this is farm laws relating to the, uh, to the uh, sales of produce, uh, of agricultural produce, uh, under the, which, which has been traditionally governed by the APMC. Acts uh, at the level of the states. These are all state acts and so forth. And, and Atul Bihari Vajpayee government tried to reform these. Uh, and for 20 years, uh, practically, uh, uh, the governments from all sides, you know, initially Vajpayee, then uh, UPA government, then Modi government, they all tried and didn't happen. And then, of course, in the end, uh, uh, what happens in these situations is that the central government gets called. Uh, called out that the, oh, the central government is not doing it for the farmers and the central government feels compelled. And so that happened, you know, the, three, the farm laws were, were uh, at, at the, 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 the central government took advantage of the flexibility uh, that is given to it uh, uh, in terms of interstate transactions and, and using that flexibility, it brought in the three farm laws, which generated, of course, huge amount of opposition. Uh, for whatever reasons, but the, but the point is that that there is this conflict, uh, and and so continuously there is this demand for on, on the center, and so the center of course is also very willing. And for the three years that I was at the Niti Aayog, I saw this happen. You talk to the NGO, you talk to the industry, you talk to the anybody. So no, no, the center should do it. And then you come and talk to the bureaucrats in these ministries and so forth, and they would say, yeah, yeah, we should do it. So this continuous centralization, tendency for centralization is, is, is sort of inherent in the political dynamics of it. How does one really get over this? Uh, I mean, that I think is, is, is really the crux of the problem. And, and this is why this mission creep has, has happened uh, with education, forest, and a lot of other things, you know, where, where actually the domain is, is that of the state. 
on the part of the states what i experienced personally was that most states would come in and you know basically the chief ministers were interested in give me more money and at least during the years that i was there because planning commission had been doling out lots of money with, uh, prior to that they still thought that that was the regime uh, so i typically you know they are, they are not coming for much of much else much of the much of the gripe on the part of the states i saw was why are you not giving us money planning commission used to do that so uh, how does one you know going forward when you make the suggestions uh, uh, clearly you know these are logical these are sensible suggestions but politically do you see that this can be done uh i mean i think this is a very as you rightly say it's a very complex question and uh, any kind of uh, a reply has a danger of uh, suffering from innate naivety of uh, not understanding the whole political uh, political dynamics uh but clearly uh, there are uh, two or three factors one is clearly uh, the factor that in the end states which undertake some of these changes will inevitably experience faster rates of economic growth and it is expected that the government which undertakes this will secure uh, electoral dividends from a much higher rate of per capita income a much better quality of education the much higher levels of agriculture and agricultural productivity i mean that would be in theory that and the fact of an aspect of competitive federalism which by the way arvin you had tried when you were in niti aayog you had tried brought in this idea of states competing with each other to improve on 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 certain performance metrics i mean that is also one aspect of of in which you can really uh, approach this or whether you could inject really competitive federalism with states vying with each other to improve the quality of uh, infrastructure the quality of per capita the quality of social and physical infrastructure on higher per capita income greater foreign incomes with that the other is of course the well known thing which has had a mixed bag of success that is incentives financial incentives now um, in the report of the finance commission you know one of the big stories arvind which uh, apart from agriculture has been bedevil state finances as you all know has been this the state of the power distribution companies in the states mm -hmm. that state governments uh, owe enormous amounts to uh, power distribution companies in fact if you look at any state finances the giant in the room is the unpaid dues or the power distribution companies and this has been which you know very well we did an apdp 1 we did an apdp 2 we did an apdrp we did an uday 1 we did an uday 2 and uh, i think that there has been only uh, very nominal changes in that as a finance commission uh, we uh, did something a little uh, unconventional that uh, based on four important criteria for power sector reforms uh, we have allowed the states the flexibility to go beyond the fiscal deficit target laid down by them under the state frbm act by half percentage point of gdp which is 1 lakh crore a year not a small amount of money and this largely has been accepted by many of the states and uh, they feel that this additional room for borrowing based on their fulfillment of certain performance criteria has would really enable them to take some steps now whether this can be replicated on areas like land reforms uh, or redistribution of land uh, farm laws and so on and so forth is a debatable issue but i think that in the end uh, we need to develop certainly a, 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 a consultative mechanism and a consultative forum uh, which enables the states to realize the value of doing so coupled with this the residuary powers of the central government uh, the competitive federalism and a combination of penalties and rewards 
to states which undertake uh, reforms which would be in consonance with larger growth objectives. Within the broad structure which the constitution has, I do not see uh, that there is any other approach. Although, frankly, when the seventh schedule is being rewritten, this is an aspect which should be taken into account. I do not think, and because Argha is also perhaps one of the persons who's listening on to this, I do not think that it should be a mechanical uh, uh, issue of rewriting the seventh schedule. When we redo the seventh schedule, the challenges of 21st century India's growth challenges, the distribution of functions and responsibilities, and how to enable India to achieve much higher rates of economic growth, coupled with the autonomy which is inherent in the constitution, should be an, should be an objective. And therefore, this exercise needs to be done with sensitivity and sagacity with a vision on the future. And perhaps when this exercise is undertaken by a competent body, which uh, Raja Manar had talked about uh, long ago, but in a revised form in a different context consisting of center of the state, that could be one way of addressing this. There's another aspect to it, Arvind. Uh, you know, anecdotally, I must tell you that, uh, you know, long ago, it was considered sinful to have any power tariff for the agricultural sector. The first time when a tariff for the agricultural sector was done was part of the follow-up of the 1991 economic reforms where Sharad Pawar at that time in a much different capacity had introduced that. And then finally, we cajoled other states to be able to do so. But the moment state elections came and one of the state governments broke the thing, I still remember the then Chief Minister of Rajasthan rang me up, Vasundra Raje, to say, what a stupid thing I have done at the suggestion of all you people. I have imposed a tariff for electricity for the farm sector. And now next door, Punjab has made it free. So how do, is this sustainable for me? So this sort of stuff that uh, state elections complicate uh, any very simple way in which one can look for a very neat and clean solution. But I think, as I said, that when this, we should give serious attention that when we rewrite the contours of the seventh schedule, whenever we do, this aspect is kept in mind. I'll stop here. Thank you, Enka. Thank you. All right. So I have uh, three questions here, uh, two from Ajay Chibber and one from Jadidia Asriel. Uh, so let me first take one question from Ajay and uh, uh, one from Jadidia, and then if there is time, I'll take Ajay's second question. So first question that Ajay has, uh, looking ahead, as population growth varies hugely across states, the issue of how to reallocate seats in parliament and the issue of how to allocate resources by the Finance Commission may loom larger and larger with considerable potential for conflict and division. How do you see this issue and what way forward to resolve it uh, is there? Uh, Ajay, uh, I think it's a very important issue. As you know, it will be fair to say that I sought to circumvent this issue in a certain way. Uh, I can even say, uh, duck the issue a bit while dealing with the with the uh, with the terms of reference of the 15th finance commission uh, arvind you know that when the 15th finance commission was constituted after 40 years this was a finance commission that was asked to use the census data of 2011 otherwise prior to that for 40 years we have been using the census data of 71. In the meantime, of course, the population configuration had grown. And so when this was done, it re, uh, raised a, a, a lot of eyebrows, concerns in states which had managed the demography very well. And Ajay, I think that you have um, uh, hit, the, uh, you have really uh, put it very well that the concerns of many of these states which had raised was as much about the likely allocations 
from the Finance Commission if I were to use criteria uh, of population. And inevitably, on many of the uh, normative criteria for in, uh, devolution the, um, between the states, this criteria has to be used. There was this apprehension that if this is so for the Finance Commission, that they have been asked to use the data, corporate census data of 2011, when the delimitation of the constituencies come, will they be asked or will it be based on the contemporary population data, which at that time could be certainly be 21. And this issue, uh, by the way, Ajay, you remember, had arisen at the time of Mr. Vajpayee also. And he then froze the issue of the, of the demarcation and, and delimitation of constituencies for quite some time. But this issue, I think, if I recall, it, this issue will come up live in 2025, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, or it could be 24, I check 24, 25. So this issue on the delimitation of the constituencies and what population data is to be used will be a, a, a very important uh, political, uh, economic and a political issue. The way in which I had, I addressed this, which you know very well, is that although I was asked to use, and I had no option, the president had desired that I used the 2011 data of the census. In doing the inter se allocation, I introduced a new criteria, not only uh, of giving certain marks to population, but a fairly significant mark to demographic management, which meant really all the things we talk about, education, girl child education, improved health outcomes, and so on and so forth. And by assigning a mark of 12 and a half uh, out of 100, a significant thing, I sought to correct the imbalance which would have occurred if in an unmitigated way, uh, giving population the weightage, which is normally given by the Finance Commission, we would have done on the 2011 data. So uh, I think there is no short answer to this. What should be the Finance Commission's uh, thing as they go forward uh, when the sixth? So uh, my award will end in. Uh, five years would end in uh, 2025. And the next set of award will uh, really kick in in 26, uh, based on the 16th Finance Commission's recommendations. So there, this issue will be live. Uh, first of all, it will depend what the president desires, which census data is to be used. Is it, the, will it be the data of 2011 or will they be asked to use the data, the latest data of 2021, which would certainly be available. And one way of doing this is to assign, as far as financial resources are concerned, is to incentivize states, reward states, which have done better demographic management by assigning resources and finances to states for improved demographic management, which in a manner therefore balances out the need question of needs of states which have a high demography with states which have done a better demographic management. How this would be really managed when it comes to delimitation of constituencies when the next time this becomes due, that's an open question and uh, I have, I have uh, no first thoughts on how this political minefield can really be traversed in a manner which would not lead to uh, a lot of animated political debate. Well, one, one, one simple way is that you want to duck the issue Ajay, is to extend the period. <laughs> Mr. Vajpayee had extended the period. You can extend the period further, but that will be really not, not quite uh, fair. Because if you ask me, after all, uh, why is the finance? Why does the finance commission, uh, invariably from the first finance commission, take in population as a criteria because they represent the needs of the people uh, who are there? So the existing population's needs will be represented by how contemporary that census data is. At the same time, there is a moral hazard in this. And what about states which have really got about uh, making a much better uh, governance process on improved demographic management?
So, I mean, we, uh, as a, when it comes to revolution of financial resources, there is a way in which we found to balance it. I don't know how it can be done on the delimitation of constituencies, frankly. Thank you, NK. Uh, so next question uh, uh, is, is from uh, Jadidia. He asks, uh, how do you view the new union ministry of cooperation, which the opposition has argued could harm federalism and the state's autonomy, given that the seventh schedule provides that cooperation falls under the state list? Well, I think that these misgivings are, in my view, exaggerated and misplaced. Because to be honest with you, much before this ministry was formed, well, there existed for a very long time, the ministry, the, a department of cooperation under the Ministry of Agriculture. The functions which are being assigned to this new department, which has been transferred from the Ministry of Agriculture to the Ministry of Home Affairs is only a transfer of the function which were earlier being performed by the Ministry, by the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department of Cooperation, without any change in the functions and entries, which pertain to the functions of the Department of Cooperation. So, as per se, I think many of these apprehensions, which are currently being expressed as an erosion on state autonomy, would, in my view, be misplaced and exaggerated. But at the same time how to rejuvenate uh, cooperative uh, societies in the states, cooperative banks, which are now under the, uh, under the, uh, under the supervision of the Reserve Bank of India, is, is an issue on which I think that it does, uh, it does give us a new opportunity of rejuvenating the cooperative movement in the country and multiple facets of cooperation the use of what technology has been able to offer in terms of improving the quality of decision making in multipurpose cooperative society by the states without impinging on the autonomy of the state. Uh, so, so anyway, frankly speaking, this apprehension in my view, uh, let us not forget this is not a new creation. The Department of Cooperation existed, reporting to the Minister for Agriculture, this department has been transferred without any addition or change in the functions. Okay, so we have five more minutes, uh, uh, NK. So, and, and I have about two to three more questions. Maybe we can go quickly. Uh, so the next one is from Ramesh Vadya. He says, is the inability of some states to reform electricity subsidy policies for agriculture the hurdle to the success of initiatives like Uday? Short answer is yes, it could be, but I believe the states that do not reform their electricity sector will never be able to have a healthy state of state finances. As I said, the giant elephant in the room of any state finance is the repair and management of the state electricity sector. States which are recalcitrant and continue to pursue a policy which is fiscally irresponsible for free power to agriculture are bound to pay a very heavy penalty in the days to come. Not only in terms of losing out the resources which has been given and the borrowing room which has been given, but in, in terms of uh, destroying groundwater aquifer, losing uh, productivity, losing long-term growth capabilities, and so the short answer, uh, Ramesh, is yes. Recalcitrant states will inevitably pay a heavy price if they show tardiness in performing the power sector. Okay, I think I'll just take one last question, which is Ajay's remaining question, NK. He says the vaccination mess is a clear example of center and state responsibilities not being clear. What views do you have on that? Let me put it this way to you, uh, Ajay, that uh, this is a very harsh conclusion to reach. After all, uh, this is a pandemic which uh, has come after more than 100 years. These are uncharted territories. Trial and experiment is the way forward. 
initially it is the states which wanted uh, the central government to delegate the vaccine procurement to the state. When that was done, they found themselves not in a position to be able to persuade the vaccine manufacturer to give directly to the states on account of various issues. It therefore really, it, uh, if you ask me, in the end, has really, uh, in the end what has succeeded is what you mentioned as a cooperative federalism, mentioned that clearly the central government is in a much better position to negotiate the best conditions and secure the procurement of vaccines. It involves an interplay of foreign policy, diplomacy, in terms of negotiating skills on price and marketing. And the current arrangement which has evolved is indeed what it ideally should have. The complications which were created was on account of some states believing that they could do a much better job than the government could do. In the end, it is the central government which should have been and was always in a much better position to do so. It was a learning curve, but I think that we have reached the right equilibrium on this. And, and okay, there's just one last question which has come here. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if you would want to answer, but, but I'll read out the question since it's here by Shashi Lata Yadav. It says, does every state have a directorate of nursing? Some of the states do have good health infrastructure. However, due to inadequate healthcare provider availability in relation to the patients, doctors and nurses, the quality of care has suffered. Are nurses involved in decision-making process in hospitals? Not sure, you know, whether you would know the answer to that question, but no. But let me say this: um, uh, uh, that I think this is a very important issue. Uh, one of the areas which uh, uh, the report given to the Finance Commission by the high-level expert committee was that the most important untapped resource, which could be harnessed to improve the human capability was the nurses and allied courses. And that through, through very, very small investment, if you could convert district hospitals into nursing colleges, give short-term courses for not more than one year to nurses, even less. Many of these people, it will provide a huge avenue of employment to young men and, and, and young girls from rural India, to get themselves educated and to be able to be, provide a very important need as a paramedic at the cutting edge, which is at the edge of the primary health centers and so on. You, uh, Arvind, you and I don't need an MBBS to take our blood pressure. I think that uh, someone uh, uh, like uh, a paramedic would be adequate uh, and it is a waste of our resources to be really seeking MBBS to take some important, just elementary responsibilities. So I think that we have made in the Finance Commission, if you look to our report, the chapter on the health has an important set of recommendations when it comes to nurses and allied courses. And hopefully when these uh, will be implemented, there would be a great scope in giving more formal content with the important suggestion which you have made. But thank you for raising this question. And Ken Poon, I'm sorry, you know, I've said twice, this is the last question, but I can't say uh, uh, no to Karthik. Karthik has his hand up. Uh, he has been uh, the, uh, uh, you know, pillar of this uh, whole four day show. So uh, uh, Karthik, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Um, thanks, NK, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I think it was the timing was great, and you know it, the content was fantastic. So I just had a small, uh, you know, submission slash question. See, I think my read of the way people think about center versus state or level of decentralization seems to be, for the most part, to say this is a topic that should be in this list. Whereas if you go back to the first principles of federalism, it feels like in every topic that the right way to cut this is not by topic, but by the first principles that say where the economies of scale really matter, those functions should sit at the higher level of government, where kind of accommodating variation and responding to local information is important, that should sit lower. So I think coming back to vaccines, this is a case where application of first principles, it's not clear that 
you know, the, the procurement should have always been at the government of India level, because that is something where there's economies of scale and you're negotiating against the world. And so why would you pit your states against each other? But it's the distribution, the logistics, the management of the last mile. So how do you actually make sure people without phones or smartphones or inability to register on COVID are getting the vaccines? It's precisely using the nurses, the AMs, and all of your last mile resources to go out there. And that's something that should be sitting much more with the states. So what I'm not seeing in this federalism debate is I'm seeing most of the discussion focus on topics as opposed to the functions within the topic, right? Whereas, you know, and if we had that clarity, and maybe the clarity is there in policy circles, but that clarity is not coming across in a lot of the public discourse. And so just wanted to get your reactions to that. And yeah. So thank you, Karthik. Thank you for um, raising this. It's good to see you. And thank you for all the support which you have given to this wonderful uh, several days event. And uh, I've seen your invisible hand. I've been following some of the emails which you have done. Uh, Karthik, I think that um, you are right. Uh, one of the subjects which, if you see in the future challenges, which I mentioned in my lecture itself, was a much greater engagement of the third tier in the whole issue of management of the pandemic and in the management of beefing up the health infrastructure as we go along. The problem I you say that after all, by the first principles, which you point out, pretty correctly, federalism is about which level of government are best designed to perform that particular function. Indeed, the constitutional amendment of 73rd, 74th constitutional amendment, assigning to the third tier, the role which it has of powers, functionary, and finances. The result, the art of those was exactly what you have mentioned. And this is the result, the art of any federal structure. But in practice, what has happened, which you know very well, that the ability, the variation across the states in any way in letter and spirit to carry out the 73rd, 74th has been a huge, huge spectrum. Uh, but there are some pleasant surprises. Like in the case of the present, I mentioned particularly, but there are some others I wouldn't did mention. Like, for instance, what a state like Orissa has done mm -hmm. in the empowering of the sarpanches. It's an amazing story of what sarpanches and the local tier have been able to do. And there is no doubt that uh, while vaccine procurement uh, is something which has externality, has issues of uh, crossover between sensible economics and sensible foreign policy and sensible diplomacy and international issues, uh, because it's a national uh, thing, you're competing with other countries. When it comes to the absolute distribution of the local level, engagement of the third tier mm -hmm. is an area which I have mentioned is an area which would be a very high priority and you would get optimized outcome of the efforts which you're making if this is emphasized. This is currently being done in a very varying way. And the overall picture, if you look at India, some states have taken many steps forward, others have lagged behind. But this is clearly an area where I think much more needs to be done. Thank you. And I guess the 10 second corollary to that is when you talk about this commission to re-architect things, we default into thinking about this as fundamentally a legal thing, but it's also at its heart, a governance and public finance issue that takes these first principles of public finance. And so hopefully, you know, that will be part of this architecture of redesigning these things going forward. Hopefully there will be an appetite, not only to have this kind of a institution, but that institution be empowered enough to go into issues which you and I have just talked. Well, thanks very much, NK. Uh, you have been extremely generous and you are, of course, uh, a great inspiration to, to the rest of us here. Yeah.